Ayn Rand once said, contradictions do not exist. Whenever you think you are facing a contradiction, check your premises. You will find that one of them is wrong. These are wise words to be sure, and very applicable when it comes to analyzing the statements and actions of the powers that be. In my last video, I discussed the op-ed piece written by Larry Summers for the Washington Post where he proposed an international agreement to stop producing currency in denominations greater than $50. He cited the reason being to curb terrorism and drug trafficking. But I then showed how the real reason has more to do with preventing a banking system failure should everyone lose faith in the banks and decide to withdraw cash. I drew some analogies between the large denomination cash notes of today and the gold of the old banking system and showed that while the overissuance of gold-backed loans in the past led to the calling in of gold, the overissuance of Federal Reserve note loans in the present is necessarily leading to a calling in of the cash of today. I ended the video by pointing out that it was interesting that in the 1980s, many nations began programs of minting bullion coins. It seemed odd that sovereign nations would have an interest in preventing its citizens from storing wealth outside of the banking system, while at the same time providing an ideal means of doing so, and one which posed no danger to the solvency of the banking system. Thus, we have a bit of a contradiction, and so we should check our premises. If you haven't seen that video yet, you can click on this screen at any time and it will launch for you. This will be the first of a series of videos where I explore the origins of the bullion coins introduced in the 1980s, and the people that initiated these programs. I will start with the US, because the information will be most easily obtained. I don't know if I'll get around to the other international bullion coin programs, We'll have to wait and see where my research leads. In this video, I'm going to discuss the Gold Commission of the early 1980s, which was put together to study the causes of the rampant inflation at the time and explore the proper role of gold in the monetary system. The report they issued is highly informative. In this video, I'm going to give a broad overview of their findings and recommendations, and in subsequent videos, I'll do a deeper dive of several of the subjects contained. The Gold Commission consisted of many individuals of diverse backgrounds from different organizations. Their job was to represent a wide range of interests and see if they could reach a consensus on the proper role of gold in the monetary system. In addition to convening for meetings, they also called upon many experts not listed here to provide their input. I've listed here on this slide the individuals who made up the commission and the organizations they represented. The organizations represented were the Federal Reserve, the executive branch of the federal government, the House of Representatives, the Senate, academia, and business. It's clear in the report that not all of them agreed on every issue, which is to be expected given their different backgrounds. However, they did manage to reach a quorum on many issues. Their common conclusions and their disagreements were all documented in the report, and so one can read the report and not only see the group's recommendations, but also read the dissenting views. It was all laid out in the open in the report for anyone who wants to go back and read it. Here is an overview of the subject matter contained in the report. The report discusses the economic backdrop, in other words, the economic conditions at the time, which included uncertainty, rapid monetary inflation, and a soaring U.S. national debt. It discussed the history of the role of gold in the U.S. monetary system, as well as times when we were on a bimetallic standard and the evolution of the monetary system, which culminated in an abandonment of the discipline of gold. It discussed possible alternatives to a gold-based system, including inconvertible paper and a commodity-based system. When it came to the role of gold, many, many different aspects were discussed, including the conduct of the Treasury and the conduct of the Federal Reserve and the possible private sector response to such conduct. They discussed implications for foreign exchange rates and the settlement of the balance of payments for international trade. They considered the role of the International Monetary Fund. They also discussed and debated many legal challenges that could be made should the U.S. try to reintroduce gold to the monetary system. And they also discussed historic production trends in gold and how the equilibrium price of gold is established. Let's first take a look at what they said about the existing gold medallion program. It's interesting to note that the gold and silver eagle programs were not the first ones to produce U.S. government certified gold and silver products for its citizens. 
There was a law put on the books in 1978 during the Carter administration which permitted the Treasury to produce medallions made from gold to commemorate artists. It was intended to be a five-year program, and the target was to sell a minimum of one million ounces of gold to the public. Sales of these medallions started in 1980, and so they were already being sold before the Gold Commission was convened. The intent of the program was not to make money for the Treasury. The medallions were sold directly through the post office at a markup less than 3% over the spot price of gold as determined on the comics. The markup was only to cover the cost of producing and marketing the medallions. Clearly this was an effort designed to provide a means of private citizens to own certified physical gold. The question we have to ask ourselves is why, which is a subject that we'll be exploring. The Gold Commission's recommendation on this program was to enhance it. They recommended selling to authorized dealers so that a secondary market would be established for selling these medallions to others. In other words, the Commission wanted these medallions to be liquid and resaleable. They recommended that the Treasury maintain its modest markup, but they also acknowledged that the secondary retailers would need to add a markup of their own. They also recommended discontinuing the program once a gold bullion coin program was set up, set up, which then brings us to their recommendations for a bullion coin program, which was not yet established. The members of the committee who supported the establishment of a gold bullion coin program had visions of how the public would benefit from such a program. Some thought that the public would treat the coins as investments, a means of storing wealth and possibly growing wealth over time. Others thought that the public might actually exchange these bullion coins for goods and services, thus making the coins a competing currency which would put a check on the current monetary system and impose some discipline on it. Importantly though, they thought it appropriate that the price of the coins float with the market and not be fixed. They wanted a free floating gold price. They wanted physical gold, certified for weight and fineness, to find its use in a marketplace and wanted the people to decide how best to use it. Still, the committee was pragmatic. They realized that there were, would be lots of implications to their recommendations. The Gold Commission had limited resources and only a year in which to complete their study and so they recommended that Congress evaluate aspects of a gold coin, uh, coin program more thoroughly before proceeding to enact such a program. One of the major concerns was regarding the, the depletion of the Treasury gold stock. Many viewed the gold stock to be of primary strategic importance, which will be discussed in a minute, and they did not want a popular gold coin program to run down the U.S. gold stock. They proposed that Congress consider authorizing the Treasury to buy gold in the open market and from the mining industry to replace the gold used to make the coins. Those who saw gold as being adopted as money did not want to put a cap on the gold supply and thought that the Treasury stock should be fair game if adequate gold could not be sourced elsewhere. Keep this in the back of your head for a moment because I'll be discussing the actual uh, Bullion Coin Act in a moment. Another implication that they thought uh, should be studied further was the impact of a coin being given legal tender status. As is always the case when le legal tender laws are changed, there are existing debtors and creditors in the system. The introduction of a new legal tender gives the debtor the choice of what is used to pay back debts where there are no specific clauses built into the debt contract, and this opens the doors for the creditors to be screwed. They also suggested that the Treasury consider a capital gain exemption on price changes on the uh, coins, but they acknowledged that this might detract from the desirability of other collectible items as investments. But those who saw gold as being used as money saw it as a key element of the program and wanted it considered. Another suggestion was that the Congress consider obligating the Treasury to buy back any and all coins that were offered to it for sale. Ultimately, the Commission made several rather concrete recommendations with regards to what to do with the bullion coin program. The first was that the coins be issued in specific weights. The Commission recommended not stamping a dollar value on the coins. This was consistent with their desire to allow the value of the coin to float with the market determined price of gold, and was also aligned with the desire of some who wanted to see a competing currency system emerge. Consistent with the goal of serving the interests of the public and giving them a means of owning certified gold, the, recommenda uh, the recommendation 
is that the Treasury continued to place a small markup on the coins so as to only cover the cost of producing them and marketing them. They saw the issue as important enough to recommend Congress put a law on the books for the production of these coins. And finally, they recommended that the coins be exempted from capital gains tax as well as state uh, sales tax. And so with all that said, let's see which of these features were adopted as part of the Gold Bullion Coin Act of 1985. Here's a table I put together summarizing the recommendations of the Gold Commission on the left against the actual features of the Gold Bullion Coin Act on the right. Not surprisingly, the Bullion Coin Act did specify specific weights to be minted. Contrary to the recommendation of the committee, Congress did decide to stamp a dollar value onto the face of each coin. Technically, this made the coins legal tender. But at the same time, the dollar value they stamped on the coins was so low that nobody would decide to use the coins to discharge existing debt. I suppose choosing such a low dollar value also eliminated the potential of the gold coins being used preferentially to dollars to discharge debt should the market value of the gold drop below the face value stamped on the coin. That's just a speculation on my part. Still, one has to consider what was the motivation to put any dollar denomination on the coin at all, as opposed to just stamping it with a weight and a fineness. I'm hoping that my research on the subject uncovers an answer to that mystery. The Coin Act did specify that the markup be modest and large enough to cover production costs. And, as the committee recommended, the Bullion Coin Act was enacted by Congress and is part of the U.S. legal code. Congress did not exempt the coins from capital gains tax or state sales tax. What we do know, however, is that the current tax code treats the capital gains similarly to ordinary income in that the percentage to be paid on capital gains is very low until you find yourself in one of the higher tax brackets. You can see some details by re reviewing my video, The Mythical 28% Collectibles Tax. One very interesting bit of language included in the Gold Bullion Coin Act is that the Gold Eagles are considered to be numismatic. The Gold Commission did not recommend this, but the authors of the law must have thought it was important enough to include. For what reason, I'm not 100% sure. But I think there was some intention behind it, and I'm hoping to someday find an answer to this riddle. Finally, it's worth noting that the law was specific about the source of the gold. It specified that the gold was to be purchased from the mining industry and that the Treasury Secretary could authorize the use of the Treasury stock, but only if purchased gold was insufficient to meet demand. So we can see that the Gold Eagle and Silver Eagle programs were very carefully considered and they took years to enact. But ultimately, laws were put in place to provide people with a means of obtaining physical gold and silver of certified weight and fineness at a cost that was only modestly above the market price of their underlying commodities. This does not seem to me to be the action of a bunch of parties who do not want people to have the option of protecting their wealth outside of the banking system. In any event, the Gold Commission had many more interesting topics that they covered, I'd like to talk about them at a high level now because many of them are very illuminating about how the government treats gold now. The Commission studied and debated allowing the Treasury to sell gold-denominated bonds. Advocates saw this as a way of reintroducing gold to the monetary system and also saw it as a way for the Treasury to reduce its interest costs on the debt. After all, if the investing community had a gold-backed bond, they would not need to be as concerned about inflation and they would not demand as high an interest rate as was on the unbacked bonds of the early 80s. The advocates also saw that eventually this would be a means of driving down interest rates on the unbacked bonds because the use of gold in the U.S. debt would require spending discipline which would reduce deficit spending and thus reduce inflationary expectations. The detractors had some good points to make on this issue. They saw a problem with a gold-backed bond that paid interest. For one, it would provide the owner of the gold bond a risk-free means of taking delivery of gold in the future that was free of storage costs and came with an interest rate sweetener. If such a vehicle was available, then there would be very little reason to own physical gold, and thus it would defeat the purpose of making physical gold available to the public. 
and the last thing they wanted was for their recommended program to fail. They also worried about the bonds devolving into a vehicle used primarily by speculators as opposed to investors. In addition, they viewed it as not being of any advantage to the Treasury Department. Issuing gold-backed bonds when the investing public at large was willing to buy unbacked bonds would only introduce risk to the Treasury that it did not have to take. Ultimately, the recommendation of the committee was not to issue gold-backed bonds. I personally view this as a wise action. After all, it was the over-issuance of gold-backed bank credit that led to the bank runs of the 1930s and the over-issuance of gold-backed debt and currency in the 50s and 60s that led to a run on the Treasury gold in the late 60s and early 70s. Gold's role is best served by not being involved in credit contracts. That's my personal opinion, not the expressed view of the Gold Commission. But let's now turn our attention to the fascinating topic of the U.S. gold stock. The content of the Commission report is very interesting when it comes to custody and storage. In 1982, the U.S. owned 264 million ounces of gold. The Commission report was very specific that the gold was the property of the Treasury and not the Federal Reserve. The majority of the gold was held in mint depositories, and a minor portion was held in custody of the New York Federal Reserve Branch. As of the writing of the Commission report, 80.5% of the Treasury stock had been audited with the intention of auditing the rest by 1984. Some members of the committee were frustrated that it should take so long to audit the gold, but ultimately agreed that they were satisfied with the audit that had been conducted thus far, and that the U.S. was accurately representing the gold that it owned. Now, here's where the issue of custody becomes very interesting, and might be a reason why the audits take as long as they do. It's easy to verify that the gold bar exists, as it is in physical storage, it's a little less easy to determine whether or not the gold bar is legitimately owned by a particular entity. Let's talk about the gold certificates mentioned in the Gold Commission report. The gold certificates are considered liabilities of the Treasury, and they show up on the asset side of the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. They are on the books at $42.22 per ounce. What the Commission report says is that the gold certificates are issued by the Treasury as an obligation against the, its gold holdings. In exchange for these gold certificates, again valued at $42.22 per ounce, the Federal Reserve creates a dollar credit in the name of the Treasury on the liability side of its balance sheet. When I say dollar here, I mean Federal Reserve notes. So in a sense, the gold is the physical property of the Treasury, but it's encumbered. It's like owning your home, but having a mortgage against it. Yes, technically you own the home, but you are not free to do anything you want with it. For example, you cannot sell your home without discharging the mortgage. Such it is with the Treasury gold. The Commission report stated that all of the Treasury gold had been monetized in this fashion. It had been converted to Federal Reserve notes that are backed by gold certificates issued by the Treasury. So in a way, the Federal Reserve notes in circulation are backed by gold as an obligation of the Treasury. The Commission report said some very interesting things about the rules associated with this arrangement. Apparently, new gold certificates can only be issued by the Treasury if the statutory price, currently at $42.22 an ounce, is increased. In other words, if the Treasury increases the book value of its gold, it can monetize the increase and obtain Federal Reserve notes in exchange. With such an easy means of closing a funding gap, one would have to wonder why such simple measures were not taken by the Treasury during recent budget crises. It turns out that the answer is pretty straightforward, as we'll see in a minute. The other interesting thing to note is that the, if the U.S. were to sell its gold, it would require the retirement of existing gold certificates with a corresponding reduction in the Treasury account at the Fed. Such an action would retire the gold certificates, but would also reduce the base money supply in the banking system. One can see, though, the similarities between this arrangement and a mortgage. The U.S. cannot sell its gold without paying off the obligations held against it. Now, this report was written in the early 1980s. Let's see if what they described still holds true today. I've taken a couple snapshots here. 
The one on the top is from the Department of Treasury and is an accounting of its gold reserve. Notice that Treasury states on its book that it owns 261 million ounces of gold and carries them at a book value of roughly $11 billion. This is because of the current practice of booking the gold at $42.22 an ounce. The picture on the bottom is a snapshot I took of the Federal Reserve balance sheet at the end of last year. Notice that it lists $11 billion worth of gold certificates held as collateral against Federal Reserve notes. This is the same $11 billion worth of gold the Treasury shows in its holdings. This is not double counting the same asset. The Federal Reserve shows an offsetting liability on its balance sheet for the Federal Reserve notes that it has on deposit in the name of the Treasury that were created when the gold certificates were printed for the Federal Reserve by the Treasury. Now, on the surface, this whole arrangement would look quite shocking and lead one to conclude that the Federal Reserve had cornered all of the U.S. gold stock and owns it indirectly. This is the stuff of dreams for a person who enjoys a good conspiracy theory. Let's dig a little deeper and find out how this arrangement came about. Let's go back to the executive order signed by Franklin Roosevelt in 1934. Remember, this was the action taken by the president as a result of the banking crisis of the early 1930s. The problem was that so much gold-denominated debt was built up as a result of risky loans that when some of the banks got into trouble, creditors worried about whether or not their claims on gold were any good, and thus there was a run on the banks. The problem with a run on a centralized banking system, aside from the obvious one of complete systemic failure, is that if you are the first in line, you get your money. If you are the last in line, you get nothing. It has nothing to do with fair or unfair. It only has to do with how quickly you recognize the problem and act upon it. Thus, the saying goes that you don't want to be the guy who starts a bank run, but once one has started, you sure don't want to be late to get in line. So anyway, Roosevelt needed a way to prevent a complete disorderly collapse of the country's monetary system, and at the same time needed a way to make sure that a large segment of the population wasn't completely wiped out. After all, the people in the front of the lines were more likely to be the financial insiders who were partially to blame for the crisis, leaving the mom and pops of the world to be left as the last in line. I know there are a lot of strong feelings about Roosevelt's action, but let's set those feelings aside for a moment and see what was done, and then we can make some judgments. Here are some excerpts from the Gold Reserve Act of 1934. I'm not going to read it now, you can do that for yourself. But here's what it says in a nutshell. Basically, Roosevelt is saying to the Federal Reserve, and so is Congress, you guys are irresponsible jerks for creating all of these risky loans. You have put the entire monetary system of this country at risk. You obviously cannot be trusted. So what we are going to do is take all of the gold that you use as an asset base, and we're going to hold it in trust. In return, we are going to give you gold certificates to serve as your monetary base. This way, we will know that the gold exists, exactly how much of it exists, and where it is. Oh, and by the way, from now on, you have to have, hold a 35% reserve of these gold certificates against deposit accounts, just as our way of making sure that you don't overextend credit again. Anyway, that's my interpretation of what was said in, in this uh, act, so let's see how it affected the Federal Reserve at the time. Here's an excerpt from the Federal Reserve Bulletin of February of 1934. Roosevelt's executive order was discussed at length, as was the Gold Reserve Act. An opinion was offered. What's most interesting to me, though, is seeing what happened to the Fed's balance sheet. Notice that at the end of 1933, the Federal Reserve held $946 million worth of gold certificates and $2.578 billion worth of gold bullion as an asset. Remember, since it's showing up as an asset on the Federal Reserve balance sheet, it technically means that the Federal Reserve owns it. It might be encumbered by loans, just as Treasury gold is now, but it was considered to be the property of the Federal Reserve. One month later, all of the gold was gone and replaced with gold certificates printed by the Treasury. So the Treasury effectively assumed ownership of 125 million ounces of gold and held it in custody in the name of the people of the United States. Personally, I view this as a Pyrrhic victory for the little guy, since the alternative was that the little guy would have lost everything if this action had not been taken. Now, I'll be the first to admit that this was a tragedy for those who value personal liberty. 
Part of the legislation forbade the individual in the United States to possess any more than five troy ounces worth of gold. In a way, though, it prevented the fat cats who would otherwise have drained the system of specie from doing so. So now we know a little bit more about the gold certificates and what they represent. I hope to do a more detailed video on gold certificates in the future, as well as the legacy price of $42.22 per ounce. But for now, I'd like to move on and discuss the rest of the report recommendations on the U.S. gold stock. The committee also discussed the appropriate size of the Treasury gold stock. While they could not come to a decision regarding the appropriate size, they all agreed that it should be substantially greater than zero. This was very interesting considering that some of the members of the committee were from the Federal Reserve itself. What was more interesting was that a minority cited as a reason for retaining a large gold stock the possibility of some future international conference where other nations insisted upon a greater role of gold in the monetary system. The minority thought it would be strategically important for the U.S. to have a substantial stock of gold if this event were to take place. The committee as a whole, though, agreed that some depletion of the gold stock would be okay if it was for the purpose of selling gold medallions. In other words, small sales to private citizens was okay, but wholesale liquidations to other nations would not be okay. They also discussed the book value to assume for the gold stock accounting. And they mentioned that raising the price beyond $42.22 an ounce would enable the Treasury to sell gold or use it for currency intervention purposes. And I can only assume that the reason why it would be necessary to raise the price in order to sell the gold is because, at the time, the stock was fully encumbered by gold certificates in the same way that it is fully encumbered today. So we can conclude that the maintaining of the $42.22 per ounce book price acts like a barrier for selling the gold. Someone of influence must be preventing the tre Treasury from increasing the price of gold that it keeps on its books. But that's just a speculation on my part. I'd love to find out. But maybe there is a statute on the books somewhere. The Gold Commission did recommend that a legislative constraint be put in place to prevent the government from spending the proceeds should the book value of gold be increased. Now, the committee also considered unconventional means of mobilizing the gold stock. They studied swaps and leases as a means of generating a modest amount of revenue. Ultimately, though, they recommended that unconventional means not be adopted due to possible unforeseen uh, implications. The other two main issues that they confronted were those of domestic and international monetary policy. First, let's discuss the domestic issues. The panel considered ways of reintroducing the discipline that gold once offered to the monetary system. One option would be to re require the Fed to maintain a minimum ratio between the supply of base money and the total stock of Treasury gold. And I'll have to look up at some point what happened since the year 1934 when the Gold Reserve Act imposed a 35% coverage ratio. Somehow this control must have been circumvented or abandoned since the passage of that act. The committee also considered defining the definition of the dollar as a specified weight of gold. This would, in a sense, be very similar to going back to a gold standard, but most members did not favor a return to the gold standard. For one, there was no sound means of determining what should be the value at which to fix the price of gold. But more importantly, there were so many domestic dollar obligations at the time that it was unclear what the impact of imposing dollar convertibility might have. Ultimately, they concluded that a return to the gold standard would not be fruit a fruitful means of controlling inflation. But at the same time, they did recognize that constraining the money supply growth was very important and recommended that Congress and the Federal Reserve study the best means by which to constrain it without denominating debt in gold, as had been done in the past and had failed. Lastly, the committee covered international monetary arrangements. They acknowledged that at the time, the dollar exchange rate was determined in the international exchange markets. The problem this created, without gold being used to settle balance of payments for so long, was that there was a huge quantity of inconvertible dollars held worldwide. This served as a very large barrier to reintroducing a gold standard. How could the convertibility of these obligations be ensured without the price of gold being established at a very high level? As a side note, this is exactly what I've been saying in my videos. There is certainly enough gold to serve the international monetary system, but not at today's price. It would be, need to be revalued upward by an order of magnitude or even more given all of the debt that has built up in the world. 
Now, considering the difficulty in introducing a gold standard to the world, the committee discussed whether or not it would be prudent to repatriate the gold held by the IMF in the name of the United States. After all, if the gold is not to be used in the world monetary system, there is no need to leave it in the custody of the IMF. Ultimately, they decided to recommend not repatriating the gold, since eventually it might be used strategically. Again, this is a hint of what might be in store for us in the future. So this brings me to the end of this discussion. It was a long one, but I hope it was interesting for you. It's interesting, is it not, that when we go back and review the written record in a search to check our premises, that we find out so much about the reasons things are the way they are now, and the intentions of those who have taken action and made recommendations in the past. I think the gold and silver eagle programs and the gold certificates issued by the Treasury against its gold are a sign that the world is not 100% controlled by self-interested villains. They are encouraging evidence that we do have some champions that are fighting to pro provide a means of ordinary Americans to protect themselves against the foolishness of the banking elite. Gold is laying in wait to emerge as the fix to our current mo financial and monetary policy insanity. And there were heroes in the past to make sure that everyone has access to the insurance policy offered by gold. As Ayn Rand said, contradictions do not exist. Whenever you think you are facing a contradiction, check your premises. You will find that one of them is wrong.